thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure to be here virtually and to, to share with you my thoughts on elite sport performance and uh, challenge you to think around your own performances maybe and is there a formula for success? So to start off with, let's look at some examples of optimal performance. And I've picked triple jumping to start off with. So here's Jonathan Edwards jumping over 18 meters. And I could name on one hand the number of people who can jump over 18 meters. So it's really, really challenging. Even though all the athletes train really hard, very few can achieve these ultimate levels of performance. And that starts to pose questions in our heads as to why that might be. And then one of the sports I've done lots in, cricket, you know, bowling at 100 miles an hour. Again, not so many people have achieved it. But why is that? And then if we move on to baseball, where they can throw a ball slightly faster, but without the run-up. So they get up to just over 160 kilometers an hour. And clearly pace almost knocks him out there. And then on to a sport Closer to home, perhaps tennis, where the world record here from someone that probably nobody on the call has heard of, interestingly. In other words, the best performers aren't always the ones who can serve or smash the fastest. Indeed, I thought I would look up what Angie Murray's fastest serve is, and it's 10% just over slower than the fastest in the world. And then finally, in terms of examples to the sport that I play, which is badminton, which is the fastest racket sport, and they get well over 400 kilometers an hour. Although I'm not going to tell you how fast I can smash, but it's nowhere near that. So I'm a biomechanist at Loughborough University. And um, as a researcher, I love to ask questions, but the area of study that I use is mathematics. So I use mechanics to try and understand and explain movements in sport. So why is it that those athletes can achieve those incredible levels of performance that perhaps we could only dream of? And in particular, I try to identify factors that are critical to performance. In one respect or from an injury point of view as well. And these two go hand in hand. You know, if you're injured, you can't perform. So you can't just concentrate on one without the other. But this presentation in the main or think from a performance point of view. And my philosophy from a, bi being a biomechanics background is that in elite sport, there are some factors that I'd expect all elite athletes to do for that particular activity. When there's lots of other things that are less important and are perhaps down to individual preference or coaching that don't really stop that elite level of performance from being achieved. And as a biomechanist, I'm trying to find what those factors are that are critical to elite performance. So is there a formula for success? Well, that's a pretty challenging and far reaching question. I'm not going to necessarily promise to give you a magic formula by the end of the presentation, but it's tempting to think that the best athletes are the strongest. And strength can mean lots of things, and I'm just going to talk about it very generically here. But is that the case? If we looked at those elite performers in those different sports that I just showed you, are they the strongest? Or does technique have an important role to play alongside that? And then if we think around an individual, perhaps yourself or others, can we work out what the limit is for an individual? in terms of their physiology um, and their technique. Would it be possible to establish that? Because if we could, that would be really useful information I could provide to a coach so that a coach doesn't try and coach someone to be something they can never achieve. And then is optimum in each sport the same? Or if we look at someone's anthropometrics or their physiology or their ranges of motion, or their basic technique. Does that change what optimum looks like? Again, something that, you know, do you coach athletes one way? Or is it far more individual than that? Then the last question is, and I'll come back to this at the very end of the presentation, could you have been an elite athlete? Like some of these that 
maybe some of you might recognize. So that's the background to what I'm going to try and cover. And then in terms of the examples I'm going to use, I'm going to start off with some experimental work we've done in cricket. We have a really strong relationship with the national cricket team here at Loughborough, who are based here from a science and medicine perspective. And then I'm going to look at things from a very different perspective, completely theoretically, using computers and simulations and seeing can we look at and understand limiting performances in gymnastics tumbling. And then I'm going to come back to badminton, the sport that I play, uh, as the third example. And uh, I'm, I'm lucky enough to uh, represent England as a veteran. And this was earlier in the year, in January, just before the lockdown, where I was representing England in the annual match against Scotland. And I'm afraid on this occasion, um, England managed to win. So sorry about that. So let's start off with cricket. Well, for those who aren't familiar with cricket, here's a video clip to start off with. So here at the National Cricket Performance Centre in Loughborough, the bowler runs up with a straight arm, propels the ball as fast as they can within reason towards the stumps at the opposite end and tries to get the batsman out. But obviously this is in a training environment. So that's the activity. And there's a broad range. And if you can bowl over... 80, 85 miles an hour, then you'd be very much classed as elite. But there'll be plenty of examples of people who aspire to do that who just can't. So the questions I'm going to address from a fast bowling perspective are, if across a group, of, you know, a wide ranging group of bowlers, are there some characteristics, some factors that the faster bowlers all do? And can I identify them and understand how that mechanically relates to performance? And then a second question, which we didn't start off to answer, but came out of the research we did, was, do you need high forces to bowl fast? Because often elite performance at the limits of what you can do is associated with being on the edge of getting injured. Well, is there a relationship there from a high force perspective in this particular activity to bowling quickly? So this is an experimental study. So this is my laboratory, if you like. Um, so this is the National Cricket Performance Centre at Loughborough, which I am lucky enough to be able to convert into a biomechanics laboratory from time to time. Um, so this is uh, one of our annual data collections where we set up all of our cameras. So we've got um, a complex motion analysis system, which I'll show you how it works in a second, along with a force plate in the ground where the bowler is going to run up and uh, bowl from um, to record the bowler um, performing. And we've been very fortunate over the years. Some of you might recognize these two bowlers on the screen. Um, so these are two of the best fast bowlers ever, arguably the best two, um, and they've been part of the data collection um, over the years. Um, so you can see the reflective markers we stick on, and we stick those on because we can track those really accurately. So we can track each of those markers as they're bowling, so within a millimeter or two. And from that, we can then understand what technique the bowler is using. So here's a bowler running up. And we record what they're doing very accurately with the system around them. What we see is those reflective markers that are stuck on the body. And you can see that looks like a bowling action, but it's a bit hard to identify each dot. Um, and um, I'm sure many of you did dot the dot when you were a kid. Well, this is 3D dot the dot. Um, so it's a bit harder and my students enjoy sometimes doing this, um, but essentially identifying which each, what each of those dots is, where it was positioned on the body, because we know where the skeleton is relative to those. And so we can drop a skeleton onto those dots and then we can then do the calculations and find out what's happening. Well, once we've got it in this computer environment, we can make it visually look a bit more like the environment, the real environment, so this time with the wickets and et cetera in. One of the things that we provide back to the coaches is how is the technique of a bowler changing over time? So if they've been working on some sort of technique, we can look in detail to see if what they think they've been changing has actually been happening or not. So that's how we collect the data. 
And let's go back to the question. So the first question was, what characterizes the fastest bowlers? So if we look at a range of fast bowlers, and across a cohort of, of good fast bowlers, we find that the ones who bowl faster run up quicker, which probably isn't too surprising. But that was a very simple first result. But we added to that and said, well, if we compare a typical faster and slower bowler in that cohort, then the bowlers who bowl quicker look more like the one on the right. And this is what we've called delaying the bowling arm. Hopefully you can see my mouse on the screen. And you can see that this arm is less far through. It's going to end up over here as they let go of the ball. Whereas the slower ballers are further through the reaction as this front foot gets in contact with the ground. And this was an important attribute in timing. A third factor that came out you know, in this cohort was that those that drive their trunk through more, this is called trunk flexion, between front foot contact and ball release, bowl faster. So we can see this line of the trunk and how far it's moved forward. And if they manage to bring their trunk through further before ball release, they're going to bowl faster. And then the last factor is a ball release. And this is what's happened to the front leg. There's a lot of force coming up through the body, six to eight times body weight. And the bowlers who resist that, who are having an appropriate geometry in their leg, and don't collapse, bowl quicker. Whereas this bowler here collapses, they lose some of that momentum and energy. So just these four factors were found to explain a lot of the variance in ball speed ignoring all other factors, size, shape, strength, et cetera. Well, how good were these four factors of predicting speed? So I'm gonna plot a graph here, which is the actual bowling speed against the predicted one. And if this was perfect, then we'd get the line Y equals X. In other words, these four factors would explain all of the variance in ball speed. Well, it was never going to be that good because we ignored lots of other things. But what we find is, that we can explain three quarters of the variance, which is really powerful with ignoring all other factors. And this, the interesting thing here is the bowl who bowled quickest in the study was a bit of an outlier compared to the rest of the group. And he was getting more out of his bowling action than our predicted variables would explain. He was one of the most powerful bowlers in the study as well. And so it's thought that the reason he can bowl quicker than the rest of the group due to these factors is because of that um, different musculature. And bowlers, or oh, sorry, coaches think about shapes. You know, they think, you know, what's that shape of bowling fast? And we found one variable was on its own was the most um, indicative of that in, in, in bowling. And that was this shoulder angle. And so we see here in the bowler who was the quickest in the study, obviously we can see the straight leg driving the trunk through, et cetera, but this big shoulder angle, driving the trunk through and leaving the arm behind them as they're letting go of the ball, bowling to the right here, was really indicative of bowling fast. Whereas the bowler on the left who bowled slower, you can see it's almost like he's trying to pull his arm through because this angle is smaller. Whereas if the angle is bigger, this was linked to pace. If we put that into a video, again, the same faster bowler on the right, the slower bowler on the left, and you can see some of the differences there. So we're starting to understand the mechanics and the techniques required to bowl fast. But is it inevitable, in the second question, that you need high forces to bowl fast. Well, here's a skeletal image of someone running up. This is the force plate in the ground measuring the force. And we've got a big yellow arrow as the force rises up through the body. Play it once more. And this is around six to eight times the bowler's body weight. This can be a potential problem from an injury perspective. Well, here I've plotted a typical force trace. So this is the force, that yellow arrow that you've just seen. And there are, I split it up into two directions. 
there's a vertical force acting up through the body and then a horizontal force. And if it's negative, it's breaking. And so we've plotted that over time. This is front foot contact when this foot first comes down in contact with the ground through to ball release, which acts over here. And when we look at those force traces, there's a few key variables that we can pull out. The first is simply how big is the biggest force. So in this case, in the units of body weights, you know, getting up to close to eight body weights. And then secondly, how quickly does that force rise? Because if it rises more rapidly, the literature would say you're perhaps more likely to get injured. And then the third measure we often use is what's the summation of the force over time? What's the overall amount of force that's been applied over a period of time? And that's the area under the graph. So those are the three measures we then looked at across a cohort of bowlers, some bowling quicker, some bowling slower. And here I've plotted two typical graphs, one from the right, a typical faster bowler in the study, and one on the left, a typical slower bowler. And then we looked at those three variables. And quite surprisingly, we found that those that bowl faster actually had lower peak forces. Here we look, we're up at close to eight body weights for the slower bowler here. Faster bowler has a much lower, closer to four body weights peak force. And then the load, loading rates were also slower as well, or lower in the quicker bowler. Well, there must be something that's bigger. And what was linked to pace was the overall amount of breaking force. So for those bowlers who bowled faster, they managed to break their forward momentum and convert that in, in, our, in part into ball speed. And that was the mechanism so you didn't need a big peak force. You needed to be able to break, but over a prolonged period of time to then generate pace. So I come back to the title of the presentation. And with this example of cricket, is there a formula for success? So here is a picture. Remember the faster bowl on the right, the slower bowl on the left. And clearly technique, because that's really all we've spoke about here, is critical. And strength, although it's important, and remember this bowler on the right, who was the fastest, got more out of his bowling action, it's much more about his technique than it is about his strength. So of these two variables, technique is the, clearly the more important variable. So on to my second example, which is completely different, and they're going to look at things from a theoretical perspective rather than experimentally, tumbling in gymnastics. So in gymnastics, a double layout somersault is a pretty limiting movement in gymnastics. So they run up and then they manage to do two somersaults in a layout straight-ish position. Well, the question I wanted to ask here was, could they do any more than that? Is that the limit to what they could do? And within gymnastics, that's pretty much seen to be the limit. Well, I'm ambitious. And instead of doing two somersaults, two and a half is no good. They're going to land on their head. So can they do a triple layout? Is that humanly possible? Well, I can't answer this question experimentally because I'm going to break a few gymnasts along the way. But could I answer this theoretically in a different way? And in doing so, how important, or is it technique that has to change to allow someone to do a triple layout? Do they have to be superhumanly strong? Or do they have to do something different perhaps in their approach and run up much faster or slower or something? So I wanted to answer this question, not experimentally, but to answer it theoretically. And so that's what we did. So I built a computer model, a simulation model of the final takeoff phase in tumbling. So here's a, a computer graphic of the person ready to do that tumbling movement. They've run up and they've turned backwards and they're doing these flip flaps backwards. And what's gonna happen during this final takeoff phase? Well, this movement is relatively simple. So I don't need too many physical representation segments to represent the body. 
In fact, five is sufficient for this movement. And because of the left and right hand side of the body are doing the same thing, I can average those two sides. So it makes it a bit easier for us to understand what's going on. So we've got five rigid segments that represent what the body is doing. But at each of the joints, we've got muscles. And so we include that as a torque generator at each joint because muscles produce a force, but there's a moment arm at each joint and the force multiplied by the moment arm gives us a torque. So we represent that by a torque generator at each of the four joints in the model. And then they don't tumble on a concrete floor, they tumble on a tumble track or gymnastics floor, which is, has some compression. So we need to include that in the form of springs. So those are the features of the model that we need to include. Well, at the moment, that model could represent anybody on this call because mechanically we're all basically the same. So what I need to be able to do is to now take this model and represent the individual athlete that we've just seen in the video. Well, to do that, I need to calculate three sets of parameters. Firstly, I need to calculate the segmental inertia parameters. So that's the length of each segment, how much mass is it, et cetera. And that's relatively straightforward to do. But more challenging is to measure and incorporate in the model how strong each joint is so that this gymnast isn't superman, it's limited to the strength of that gymnast. And to do that, what we do is we take the gymnast and here is the gymnast on a complex weights machine called an isovelocity dynamometer. And as the name suggests, isovelocity, it controls how quickly the gymnast can move their arm. So here we're measuring at the shoulder and this is one end of the range of motion through to the other end of the range. And what the machine does is as by controlling the velocity of the crank of the machine, we can calculate or measure the maximum torque this gymnast can exert. So the gymnast tries really, really hard. You can see in that top picture, they're grimacing as they pull really hard. And we measure the torque as a function of the angle of velocity. And then we repeat this for different angle of losses. And that gives us a time history of maximum torque at the joint. What we can then do is to put that and fit it to a curve. So we can calculate the parameters which define how strong that gymnast is at that joint. And in doing so, it means that the simulation model represents that gymnast. So if I did it, the curve might be much lower, for example, um, or if a bodybuilder did it, this curve would be higher. But this curve represents their strength. And then during a simulation, the model can use up to this value of torque as it changes a function of angle and angle velocity, but no more. So at this point, I've built a simulation model. I've, be, I've built a computer game, if you like, that represents that elite athlete. The question is, is it any good? Well, I've got some reference data. I've got the gymnast performing the double layout somersault. And that I'm going to show across the top here. I'm then going to ask the model with the constraints of the masses and the strengths, et cetera, can the model start off and do what the gymnast did? Because if it can, I can then don't need the gymnast anymore. I can then run simulations with the model and see what would happen under different situations. Could they produce a triple layout? Well, here's the comparison. The actual performance across the top and the completely theoretical forward dynamics across the bottom. And as we can see, they look very similar throughout. And there's just a few percent difference. But from a performance perspective, I can now use this to do some calculations. So I'm happy that the model works. I've done my due diligence and confident that the model is going to give me realistic simulations. So I then go to the model. I don't need the real performer anymore and said, perhaps your technique wasn't very good. Even though I've collected data on an elite gymnast who's trained for years and years optimizing their performance, perhaps the model can do better. So I'm going to keep the strength of the model and the approach characteristics the same. And could the model do any better? Instead of doing two somersaults, the model does two somersaults. 
Well, this was really reassuring when I got this result, because if I'd managed to produce a lot more at this point, I probably wouldn't believe it because the athlete we collected the data on was an elite athlete. And therefore, it would be very surprising if a simulation could do so much better. So this supported the evaluation, but it didn't help me get to a triple layer somersault. Well, the next thing I wanted to look at was strength. So this time I made the model as strong as I thought was possible or even beyond the limits of what was possible. So I made it 50% stronger at every joint and that was easy. I could program that very quickly. Whereas in reality, imagine how long that would take in the gym for an athlete who's already really well trained. It might be almost impossible. But if I do that and I've then asked the model, can you do any better? Instead of doing two somersaults, what could you achieve? And instead of two somersaults, oops, he does a little bit more, but this is clearly no good. You know, fortunately, this is all a computer model, so I'm not going to have broken anyone, but it's not going to get me to a triple layout. So strength, in fact, what we find in tumbling is not the limiting factor at all. So we quickly move on. So I put the strength back to what it was, back to 100%. And then started to think, well, in tumbling, which is different to gymnastics tumbling, they have a longer approach run. And the data I'd collected was on a gymnast who'd got a restricted run because they have to do the gymnastics movements on the floor. And we looked and said, well, realistically, we could increase approach speed or approach velocity by 50%, up to 150, and still be able to do the tumbling movement. So we put that in as an input condition, increase the velocity, but kept the strength back where it was, and then ask the model, how much more can you do? And this was the result. So instead of two somersaults, the model did three. But the gymnast had never done this. So the question was, well, and nobody had done this in the world at this point. Was this possible? Was this realistic? So I went back and thought about it from my biomechanics point of view. Is this realistic? Or I just produce something that's, a, that's not possible? Well, if I think about elite performance in sport, yes, it's a high level, but it's also consistent. In other words, if I took a gymnast and asked them to do the same movement 10 times, within reason, they'd do it 10 times and they'd all be successful. Whereas if I asked the computer model to do the same movement 10 times, it does it exactly the same to the machine accuracy that we've got. In other words, it's perfect. In fact, it's too perfect. And what we need, if it's going to be a solution in the computer environment that's realistic, is that it's an optimum solution that can cope with errors. It can cope with noise. Because if we ask do anything 10 times, it's different every time, but each time it's successful. Well, what would happen if I took that triple layout somersault and perturbed it, added in some variation? Would it still manage to do a triple layout? So I did that and I perturbed, and here's just six examples. On the vertical axis here, we've got the reduction in performance. And if this was a good solution, for that triple layout, all of the bars horizontally would be very small. In other words, whatever perturbation I threw at the model, it wouldn't make much difference and we'd have a successful outcome. Well, if I look at this graphically, instead of three somersaults, I'm back to just over two. So in other words, that solution I'd found to be a triple layout wasn't realistic because if I added some perturbations, couldn't achieve the triple layout. So does this explain why we can't do a triple layout? Or is it because I've not asked the computer to find the best solution? So in that first optimization, what I'd done was I'd asked the computer to find the best solution in terms of rotation. I hadn't asked it to find a solution that was like a human. And computers are silly or stupid. They only do exactly what you ask them to do. So 
I went back to the computer and said, find a solution that is robust to noise. And when I did that and re-optimized, I then managed to reduce these bars so that across all the perturbations, I only had a small reduction in performance. The question was, was this a triple layout? So I do that. And what do you know? I get back to the triple layout. Of course, I still had the question. I'd mathematically shown that this was realistic and achievable, but there was nobody doing this. So it left me in a bit of a dilemma. However, someone came to my rescue and sent me a video. Someone running up fast. This is a tumbler running up fast and producing a triple layout, but only just. In fact, you'll see they'll land on their head, so we'll move on before it gets a headache. But then more recently, it was this person. So a second example of someone now being able to do a triple layout. So I've got my theoretical prediction, completely theoretically, and now a couple of examples of people managing to achieve that, but it's very much at the limit of what's possible. Well, how have they done that? They've clearly done that through having really good technique. And in this case, for this movement, running up fast while still being able to do the movement. And strength really isn't a limitation here in many respects. So that's two of my examples. The third one, the sport that I play, uh, badminton. Well, there's lots of different movements in badminton, but the one that is perhaps the one that's most exciting is the jump smash. So here's some data to start off with in a jump smash. This is one of the best players in the country, in England, performing a jump smash. If we look at their technique, and then compare it to another, this time a top singles player, you can see that the techniques are a bit different. So of course, that asks and ends up wanting to answer questions. If we think about those two techniques, how close to optimum are they? Could we find out? I asked the coaches, or I asked a range of coaches, some might say one thing and some might say something different. Could they smash any faster? Just like the tennis serve we saw earlier. Now, if Andy Murray was able to serve faster, would he have won more grand slams? And then why are some people able to smash so much faster than others, even at the elite end of the game? Can we understand that and how could we possibly use that information? Well, when we started this study, there isn't so much funding in badminton. So our first data collection in badminton was actually in my dining hall at, at Loughborough University. I'm fortunate to have a big dining hall because I'm a warden of one of the halls of residence. So when all the students aren't eating their tea, I'm able to um, set up a badminton court if I ask very nicely. So that was our starting point. And we can see the markers on the body, just like um, for the experimental cricket study. So this is going to be an experimental study here. And we tested a range of athletes from some that are very young. So this was actually um, uh, my youngest son having a go. We all play badminton in the family. And, uh, it's much better seeing his smash than mine. Uh, so this was uh, quite a few years ago and he's uh, turning into a nice little player now. But this was his smash. Through to, this is at the All England Championships uh, a few years ago now, and this is one of the top few players in the world. So again, we've got lots of really high quality data on the jump smash. And here's some other data that we collected, this time one of the top uh, females in the country. And then this guy's got a an Olympic medal. 
in fact, we also came up to the World Championships in Glasgow. So we were fortunate um, a couple of years ago to come up to Glasgow. And here's one of the top Scottish players, Alex Dunn, getting part, getting, getting involved in the study. So this is really slow motion video. But you can see for each of these players, the techniques are very similar, but they're also a little bit different. Well, you should all be experts in what we see now. So what we see in the raw data is those dots. So we accurately understand what the player has done. The students then go through and join the dots up. We label the trial. And then we can put a, a skeleton on top. So if we do that for a range of players, and we've got data from probably over 100 now in badminton, what do we find out? Well, impact location and outcome, the outcome of the smash. Well, the first thing to say that badminton is the fastest racket sport in the world. And so the shuttle changes from going basically at zero kilometers an hour to, if they're good, 400 kilometers an hour in one millisecond. So that was pretty challenging but we managed to do lots of equations and curve fitting to work out what was happening. And so we're able to accurately work out where the shuttle is hit on the racket and what's happening afterwards. And nobody else had managed to do that. So if we took a range of subjects and just picked their fastest smash, we collected about 40 on each player, then this was the pitch map on the racket of where the shuttle made contact. If we added in those that were the top, you know, within five percent of the best, we start to get a really nice picture of what's going on, and then it can include a few more. And if we summate that, what we find is they don't quite hit in the middle, which was a bit surprising. And what we find though is the pronation supination of the forearm influences where they hit on the racket so that they actually hit slightly off center because in that place, the racket is moving slightly quicker due to the pronation, but only just, you know, a centimeter or so from the middle. We can see there the sort of the deviations from standard deviation perspective as they move further and further and where the data would put them. So that's our heat map on the racket in terms of speed. If we also do the same thing in terms of direction, Again, we see the darkest area is just almost one string from the middle, if not one and a half or two. Well, the effect of that on where the shuttle goes is quite substantial. So if we take those one, two and three standard deviations in terms of impact location on the racket, we can see how far the shuttle will deviate before it lands. In other words, you'd have to be a brave person to go for the line. And you often see that in racket sports, the player just misses. Well, that could just be down to a very small change in where the shuttle or the ball had hit on the racket. Well, what about this buildup of speed? So how do we get to 400 kilometers an hour? Can we understand that? So let me see, there's a sequence and you'll see different parts of the body coloring as they get faster. So here's a typical jump smash. And you'll see the first part of the body to really light up from here going forwards is the trunk. The trunk is being forced forwards. So the movement starts at the center. It then travels down the arm to make the racket go really fast through to the end. So if I pick out those places. And so the importance of the trunk in terms of building the speed up through the arm is critical. In fact, what we find is that those that smash fast have something that we found in other sports as well. They have increased axle rotation. They're driving, twisting their spine, if you like, to achieve the high speed. 
but also like in cricket, they have increased trunk flexion forwards relative to the others. So you can see between these two positions, there's a change in that flexion. But what else came out as important? Well, one of the most important variables which you hear about in all racket sports is shoulder internal rotation. So I've plotted here for the cohort. So this is between the start of the movement and, and shuttle contact with the racket. And this is the internal rotation angle. And the thick or the bold line is the average. And this is the standard deviation across the whole data set. And we can see that they all follow a similar path in that there's some counter rotation of the shoulder. So it externally rotates and then it rapidly internally rotates up to contact. And on the right here, I've just picked out the quickest and the slowest smashes in the study. And what we see here is that the quicker one has a much more rapid internal rotation at the end. Whereas the slower person tries to internally rotate and starts earlier, but can't get up to that same sort of speed so it's much slower. And so the technical difference between those that can smash faster and those that can smash slower is quite clear. Then the X factor. Again, we have the same sort of plot from the beginning through to contact, the average and standard deviation. But if we focus here, we can see the person who smashes faster manages to counter rotate their trunk much more before then recoiling. And this value is in clearly linked to pace. And the last one I will show you is in terms of racket acceleration. And so here again, we've got the average and the standard deviation, and we can see nothing really happens for most of the time. And then the speed suddenly increases at the end a very fast acceleration, the slope of this graph is acceleration. And if we compare the fastest person and the slowest, just like with shoulder internal rotation, the slower person, or the person who slow, smashed slowest, but still pretty fast in the study, started earlier and had a much less steep curve, whereas the person who was able to smash fastest left it much later, quite a substantial bit later, but then had a massive acceleration to achieve a much higher racket head speed and therefore shuttle speed at the end. So we understand the technique behind what people can do. What's not clear at this point is if could you take this person who smashes slower and through training and coaching, uh, let, get them to here. And that's you know, for another day. So I've shown you lots of information on the smash there. So I'm going to pose a question to the audience at this point. There's two sequences here from a study. This is for, with some data with some Malaysian elite players. Um, the top sequence and the bottom sequence are in no particular order, the fastest and slowest smashers in the study. But which one's faster? I've told you what's important now from a technique perspective. Do you think it's A or do you think it's B? So make a mental note, have a look. Which do you think of these two people smashes faster? Because this could be the difference between being a world champion and not making the final or even just being elite, but not really elite. And hopefully you're finding it really difficult to tell. But if you've guessed and you've guessed A, then give yourself a pat on the back because that is the quickest person in this study. And the slowest person in the study is at the bottom. And the thing that some you know, coaches often look at this position here, which is the fourth, if you can see my mouse, I don't know if you can, but the fourth one in, was the interesting bit all happens at the end. So if you look at this next to last image, you can see just like, think of the cricket where the arm was more, there's a delay in the arm. Well, look at the arm here and the racket particularly, it's further back. In other words, there's a bigger range of motion that the racket's got to go on to get to the same sort of position of contact. 
And that's where the speed comes from. So, in summary, I've shown three studies. In all three, technique has been critical. Strength has been much less important. Now, all of the athletes in the studies have been strong. Of course they have. But at the elite end of sport, everybody's strong. But probably the difference is far more down to technique than it is to pure strength in terms of elite performance. So is there a formula for success? Well, if I had to be a betting man, I'd be putting it down to technique far more than strength. Hopefully what you've seen is the presentation that you can understand what the limit is for performance using computer modeling. We've not done that in a broad range of sports, but we've done it in tumbling, cricket, and a lot of other gymnastic skills. And then we start to understand what does optimum look like. And what we find is that across a range of people, that the optimum is similar, but it's subtly different, but it has that same characteristics, those same factors that are critical from person to person. And of course, you've got to now answer this question. Could you have been an elite athlete? Just like some of these Scottish performers. Well, of course, this sort of work is not possible without um, a lot of support and help. And I'd like to acknowledge you know, the following organisations and also all the staff and students at Loughborough that helped me on this journey uh, to understanding optimum performance in sport. And I hope you've enjoyed and you know, it's made you think more about elite sport than uh, previously. And uh, thank you. We've got quite a few interesting questions in. And one of the very popular questions, Mark, is, do you think the fast bowlers would be equally talented at javelin and vice versa? And that's the question from Morag Cunningham. But it's been also been backed up by Leonard, who's asking, and what about the technique for golf or fly fishing? So we're very versatile. <laughs> Brilliant. So um, absolutely, there is a very strong link between the technique used in fast bowling and also that used in javelin. Um, in fact, I can give you a real example of someone who came to Loughborough who in the end stopped bowling fast because they, they had too much extension of their arm. They have to bowl with a straight arm for those who know cricket. Whereas in javelin, you don't have that same restriction. And they've now become an absolutely outstanding javelin thrower. Um, so they transferred from one to the other. And uh, when I used to sit down with the elite fast bowling coach at the ECB, he had a sequence, a bit like I've shown you here, of the best javelin thrower in the world and said, that's the perfect fast bowling action. So there is a very strong resemblance um, between javelin and fast bowling, absolutely. Now, in terms of fly fishing, and what was the other one? Golf. And golf. So the X factor um, that was originally first um, uh, looked at in golf. So that that movement, uh, that twist of the torso um, to counter rotate the body and then to recoil um, was been very clearly linked to um, hitting the ball a long way in golf. And we found the same to be true in cricket batting. Uh, batting and golf are very similar, but it's also true, it would appear, in some of the overhead racket sports as well. And it's not unsurprising that, you know, the, the mechanics of these different sporting movements are linked. Um, essentially, to generate pace, you, know, either, you have to either be able to exert force very, very quickly, or you have to be able to extend the time over which you can exert the force. So the reason that the X factor comes out as important in golf and uh, batting and some of these overhead skills is you have a longer range of motion over which to exert force onto the object to make it go fast. Fly fishing, well, I actually go, I'm a fisherman myself. I, you know, it's my downtime, I go fishing. Although I've, I'd love to come up and try some fly fishing in Scotland, but um, you know, so, uh, there's not so much of that round here. But it's the same sort of principle. 
you know, if you think about the, for those that are the fishermen on the call, that pulling back and leaving the line floating in the air gives you time to that range of movement over which to generate the speed. It's a whiplash type movement. And that's how you crack a whip in the same way. So yeah, they're all linked one way or another. Thank okay. you. On a similar theme, someone who doesn't give us the name is asking, did the jump smashers all use the same equipment? And how much difference does the racket make? So, so that's a great question. And um, it does make a difference. And uh, we played around very early in the study, the one where I showed my son um, smashing um, but in my, in my dining hall, but with not with him, but with uh, the other people at that part. And we tried them using a control racket as well as their own, but it takes time to learn to use a particular racket. And so in more recent data collections, we've asked them only to use their own racket, but we've also looked uh, separately as to how much contribution does the racket make um, because it does make a difference. And if you use the wrong racket or the strings aren't strung properly, then you're not going to perform as well. But it's of the order of le around five or six percent difference. In other words, it's not going to take someone like me who can't smash that fast, unfortunately, and make them into a really super duper smasher. But you look at other sports, so uh, Nadal in tennis, I'm pretty sure he increased the, some put the weight in his racket head because if the all else being equal, if you can make the racket head move at the same speed, but you have more mass or effective mass in the racket head, the resulting projectile will go quicker. So it does make a difference, but it's, it's fraction compared to the technique of the person. I'm probably going to move through these questions in the order in which they've been put in or that they've been upvoted. Um, but we do have quite a range of them. And Dallas Carter has asked, do potential athletes have to start training at an early age? And if so, how early? Is any age too young? He's probably trying to avoid any um, encouragement for him to get out and do something. <laughs> well, there's certainly been a tendency in the last uh, 10 or 15 years for people to become or, or put more pressure on youngsters. And we've seen examples in tennis and other sports of you know, people very young becoming very, very good. The literature tends to, and it's not my area specifically, tends to say the opposite though. You know, so having a broad base of activities you know, and doing lots of sports when you're younger is more beneficial that rather than professionalizing and focusing at one sport when you're really young. To me, I think it's about not getting into too many really bad habits when you're young. In other words, then whatever sport you do at whatever age, it, you know, you're always improving, you're always practicing good things. And so having really good coaches in, in schools and in sports at a young age, I think will help people achieve their potential. But you have to remember not everybody can be a world champion. And I think the danger at the moment in sport is, you know, we see lots of people you know, almost as young, youngsters, 12, 13, training for hours and hours and hours on a daily basis, they burn out. And you're almost setting them up to fail. And I think you, you, you forget the enjoyment side of sport. You know, people should primarily play sport to enjoy it, I believe. And then if they're any good, great. And, you know, set them on a pathway to improve, um, et cetera, and, you know, and what that requires. But don't put too much pressure on kids. Um, I think there's too much and you see lots of kids. So a lot of people, so I you know, still play badminton you know, and love playing now and I'm 49. Um, there's very few people who I used to play with when I was 18 still playing. Most have you know, um, you know, stopped in their early 20s. And there's a multitude of reasons why they did that. But sport is a, to me is, um, you know, it's a lifelong thing and not just about you know, being the best. Some people will be the best and absolutely we should put them on the right pathway to achieve that but we shouldn't be um, putting too much pressure on kids. Excellent. So there's hope for us all yet. Absolutely. Yeah. Come and join me in the vets, <laughs> whatever your age. Um, Pat Monaghan asks, does your modelling of optimal performance include the risk of injury? It's a, that's a really good question. And um, injuries are challenging because they're multifactorial. So you could have the best technique in the world and the best conditioning in the world and play too much and get injured. 
So in other words, there isn't one factor, whereas, it, you know, in terms of performance, maybe there is one factor in some of these, which is speed. Whereas for an injury perspective, it's multifactorial. Now, having said that, some techniques are clearly more likely to result in injury than others. So if you look at the, the one I showed you here on the, the ground reaction force, if you've got eight or 10 body weights coming up through your leg and you do that repeatedly, it's ending, it's not going to do the best you know, of good to your body. So whereas if there's an equivalent technique which allows you to achieve the same performance, but with much less load on the lower limb, then you're more less likely to get injured. But if you, if you weigh these two things up against each other, performance has to come first if you're wanting to be an elite athlete. You know, because otherwise you, you'll be in the pack. You'll never achieve that level of performance. But how much you can train and how much you can compete may vary dependent on your technique. So you might think of you know, having some, you know, athletes having um, some sort of, um, you, know, you know, if they're really, if they're prone to injuries, then you wrap them in cotton wool. But when they perform, they perform to that high level. And you see that in cricket now where they've got the shorter format of the game called 2020 cricket. And there are some people who specialise in that because they can't play all day because their bodies let them down. But the modelling itself, it, 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 I've, I've got other examples I could have shown you, say, in tennis, where we looked at tennis elbow injuries. And essentially where we stop is we look at what other techniques that are linked to increased load. And those are the ones that are more likely to be injured. Thank you. And, oh, it's just gone. Ian McLoon has a question asking, is the shape and size of the body not an important contributory factor? And could it be a limiting factor in achieving elite status? Um, I think the answer is in a simple answer is yes to the second part of that question. Um, quite early in some of my research, we looked at what's the relationship between size and shape and technique and performance. And what you found is the same basic factors were important, but the timing and the particular you know, um, individuality was made that the techniques were slightly different. Now, there'll be some activities like running where your total body mass is important. You know, if, you're, if you can do the same, but with 10% lighter, you'll, you'll clearly you know, run faster. Um, in other sports, it's not so important. Um, so in terms of limiting performance, the sort of activities I've looked at, I don't think it limits, you know, where if it's a one-off movement, if it's more endurance based, then I think it has more of an effect. But technique person to person definitely changes, but it, it's based around the same theme and factors that I've shown are important. We have a couple of questions about the triple tumblers. Yep. Um, do you have any information about how they develop their techniques? This is from an anonymous attendee. And do you know if they were aware of your results? And then Neil Monaghan is asking, well, he's saying the triple jump is a more complicated jump than the long jump. Does that mean that your kind of analysis could do more to improve triple jump performance than for the long jump? Okay, so I think there are two questions in there. We've got ones to do with the, the tumbling and the triple layout, and then we've got ones to do with the triple jump. Um, yes, so, sorry. If I, so if I think of triple jumping and long jumping, um, the, the, um, the question is quite right to say that the triple jump is a much more challenging activity than long jump. And, um, you know, because you've got to almost do three jumps in one in the triple jump, whereas in long jump, you, you just do one takeoff. And, you know, quite a, a number of years ago, Jonathan Edwards, who was the video clip that I started the presentation off with, um, said that the reason he didn't jump over 18 metres more often was because it was really difficult to get the technique right. Uh, and there's something that, you know, a colleague of mine uh, at Loughborough did a model of triple jumping, uh, which I haven't shown here, um, but um, explained how Jonathan Edwards managed to jump over 18 metres in essence. And it's to do with how you use your arms. So at each of the takeoffs, you have a double arm shift, which is unnatural because it breaks the left, right, um, you know, the natural running motion. So both arms are doing the same thing. Whereas if you think of when you run, when you run, when arm, one arm goes forward, the other arm goes back, a bit like your legs, 
but to achieve optimum performance and triple jump requires both arms to do the same thing during each of those takeoffs. So it's technically very difficult, but if you get it right, you can achieve that much more. So that's the mechanism behind triple jumping. But interestingly, long jumpers, as far as my wear, although it's not something I've looked at a lot recently, don't do the double arm shift. And I think that's because in long jumping, the run up speed is so much more important because if you have to change your arm position to achieve the double arm shift, then I think it means you can't run up quite as quick. And in that sort of performance, the run up speed is so important. So they're running up in well in excess of 10 meters per second. If I then come back to the, um, the tumbling, the tumbling is interesting. So that work was part of my PhD. So it's, it's quite dated now. And um, by the time I'd got the results, the gymnast who was this, the subject in my study had retired. So there was no opportunity to, to um, in fact, I got critiqued at that at a conference many, many years ago and said, well, did you apply it? Did they then do a triple, a triple layout? And I said, I'd love that to happen. But of course, um, it just wasn't possible. But um, it was very nice to see that, you know, there are a couple of examples of people now doing that movement, uh, which at the time nobody was. And it's, it, and it shows you how, we, and we've used it in multiple sports now, we can start to understand the limits of human performance. Um, the other problem, not problem, but um, observation there is that sort of work is really costly. So we don't do you know, work with athletes on a day-to-day -to -day basis with that, because even with the athletes we have done, it takes a two to three month turnaround to, to take the data on an athlete, make a model, and then get the results back to them. So it's far more being used in understanding movement in sport, although we have done it um, with real athletes in cricket and helped improve their performance. So I didn't show you here, but we've gone you know, for a, a couple of years now, had models of cricketers bowling, and then the coaches use that information in their coaching to help them improve their performance. Right, thank you. And I think I know the difference now between a jump and a tumble. <laughs> um, um, Right now, Rosalind Carmichael is saying you didn't touch on the psychological components of success and um, the reaction to stress, and she'd be interested to hear. I mean, in sport, yeah, in sport, this is critical, and um, it's a completely different discipline to biomechanics, and um, but it's 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 in. You know, at the top end, they often say it's the psychology that makes the difference and mentally strong and resilient, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, I've got wonderful colleagues at Loughborough that specialise in this. What I'm looking at here is what they can achieve under ideal conditions, if you think of it like that. Now, the modelling touches on the psychology a tiny bit in that when I looked at um, being robust to perturbations, what you'd expect under a stressful environment is that you know more errors or other things would come into your technique and have you got a technique there that can cope with those perturbations but it only touches the surface so in essence in most of my work i'm assuming things are optimal in other words when i ask my model to improve technique i'm, I'm not restricting it based on psychological influence um, but it is a clearly a very important part of sport at the top end. But yeah, it's outside of the boundaries of, of what I do. And we have someone else who's not giving us the name, but saying most, most people who take part in sport are not elite athletes. Do your studies have anything to offer to the club, club player who's keen to improve? So I would say so, because I'm showing you what's important generally in sport. So if, you know, you know, I'm, I'm in some respects, uh, you know, I play, you know, a club level of badminton, you know, at a, at, at a youngster's age versus, you know, an elite level at the veterans. And, um, you know, if I look at the people around me, they all would like to smash a bit faster. The fact that they can't smash anywhere near as fast as the elite doesn't matter but the sort of understanding that I can gain from the elite can help people at any level, one would argue, be it in cricket or badminton or tennis or any sport. So understanding what's important can then help them. 
And part of the work we're doing at Loughborough now is to say, how can we take what we've done with elite and we've looked at elite athletes in many sports? How can we use that knowledge and get it out there to a much broader population base? Because everybody would like to be a bit better. I'm sure those on the golf course tomorrow morning would love to be able to hit the ball just that little bit further or a bit more consistently and are tweaking with things all the time, you know, as they, as they try and learn things. And the, the understanding that we can gain from biomechanics can help with all of that. Now we have um, an interesting question in again from Glenard asking about the effect of drugs and illegal or legal, I think they're all <laughs> illegal uh, in sport. Um, does your analysis take any cognizance of that? <laughs> Not directly, um, and I've never done, knowingly done any work with people who've been taking drugs. Um, but what I can show is, you know, it's interesting the drugs because often the drugs is going to influence the strength, but it also influences from a recovery perspective, is my understanding. So that if you are taking performance enhancing drugs, you're able to train harder and more frequently, which might mean you can improve your technique more, or does it improve your strength? Um, so I think that the simple answer is no, um, but if someone produced performances that were had impossible strength characteristics, then in theory, I would be able to show that that was beyond human limits in some way, shape or form, but not directly, no. And Colin Miller is asking, with similar elite athletes, athletes do different anaerobic thresholds significantly affect their performance so you know this is more from a physiology perspective mm. so anaerobic threshold is sort of the the level of performance you can achieve say if you're doing a 1500 meter race um, and the, the, what's the level of technique and performance that you can maintain without tipping over the edge um, it's 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 there's an interaction between physiology and biomechanics here um, it's, an, it's not an area that I focus in because of the sort of sports I'm looking at are looking at these one off performances where an anaerobic threshold doesn't matter because there's time to recover. Um, but if you pull back and some of my colleagues will look at, say, uh, middle distance running, that's a, the, the simple example or cycling. And there's a link between how much power or muscular force you can exert. Um, before you tip over the edge and get into that anaerobic zone. So there is a link there between optimal running technique, for example, um, and that link then back to your anaerobic threshold, but it's not something that I directly look at. And Alison's asking something along similar lines. Is there a point at which the physiology of a, an individual will limit their progression to elite status? The simple answer is yes. And um, I think what's interesting from my perspective is to try and understand what the limit is for performance of the individual in front of me. And that's something we can do by understanding what their physical capability is alongside, you know, what optimum technique looks like them. So that a coach doesn't try to do, get someone to do something they'll never achieve. You know, so they might try, you know, try and try and try to coach them to, to throw the ball further. But if they're at their physiological limit, then they're never going to be any better. Um, and that's, you know, you, you're asking them to do the impossible. I don't think where we are at the moment can well define that um, currently, but that's what we're trying to get is one of the next steps on the journey for us in understanding technique is to say, can we understand the talent and potential of the individual and at what age? So if you took someone, say Chris Hoy, and if you looked at him at age 10, could you have predicted he would have achieved the success he had? Possibly not at this point, but could you in the future? Maybe. Um, or someone else who's not given us the name is saying, when using reflective dots, as you do, what yep. portion of the bowler's body action do you miss? For example, would knowledge of how their feet or toes flex had anything useful? So, we what we so there is a limit to what we can glean from the current motion analysis, and sometimes we need to use um, different techniques. 
So some of my colleagues in sports tech, for example, will use um, um, a speckle effect on trainers to then plot the stresses and strains through the feet uh, for different trainers because different people need different shoes, you know, if they're going to support their body appropriately. But at the level that I look at, which is at the whole body, this sort of marker set, which gives the main features of each of the, the key segments in the body tends to be good enough. But sometimes, for example, if I'm wanting to think how important are the fingers in a particular, say it was dart throwing, one of my colleagues loves darts. And um, so there they would stick markers on each finger separately to try and understand that. So it, it's, there's a generic starting point which understands how the whole body moves, but then sometimes we need to go beyond that to look at specific areas. So one of my colleagues in cricket, for example, has a much more complex marker set on the lower back because one of the injury issues is stress fractures to the lower back and how those individual segments in the lower back move relative to each other is really important. So he has a, a more complex marker set that's built on top of the standard one that we use. Now, I can't just see the question, but somebody was asking about um, instrumentation in shoes and whether so, shoes are an important factor. So, so they are. Um, whether they limit performance is interesting. And um, you know, there's, you'll have seen one of the, the key manufacturers out there introduced in the last year, some different sort of running shoes. And then the one guy broke the, the two hour marathon barrier. And uh, in part, that was possibly down to a, you know, a carbon insert in his shoes is my understanding, which returned more of the energy. So in some respects, trainers and shoes can make a difference. But in most cases, in the sort of activities that I'm looking at, then I don't think they do. Um, but instrumentation, be it in clothing or be it in shoes, is becoming more and more useful in day-to-day -day sport now at the elite level. So you'll see a catapult type unit, you know, in the rugby. If you watch the rugby, all the players and the, um, and the referees have this unit between their shoulder blades at the top of their back, tracking their movement so they get more accurate performance analysis data on you know, how they performed within the game. And also then starting to have some real time information. You know, can they spot when a player's getting too fatigued and they need to replace them and have a sub, for example. So instrumentation within real life performance is getting more accessible than it certainly was 10 years ago. And then the challenge of course, is how to use that information to the best effect. Never thought there'd be so many questions on this, but there are lots and lots. And Alison is asking, in multidisciplinary discipline sports, how do the various techniques for each event affect each other? So that's such as in a triathlon or something, I think. Yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's, a, it's another great question. And I think what you see there is that if you compared any of the one individual, say to a triathlon, and you took, um, say, the swim or the cycle or the run separately and compared them to the very best athletes in those individual sports, the triathlete wouldn't compete, you know, um, in most cases. Maybe they would in one of the events out of the three. Um, and what you're seeing there is that, that difference between specialising in one versus you know, having to spread across multiple. Now, maybe that means that they couldn't have achieved more in any one, I, d I don't know, um, or whether it's because of the, the challenges of having to train across a multitude of sports. So in, you know, if you looked at heptathlon or decathlon, you know, you'll often see that the athlete, you know, sometimes they try and compete, say in the long jump in the main event, and then they'll also then do the heptathlete, but they're, they're unlikely to be able to compete at the very best level in all of the different events. And some of the, that will be down to the training. Now you've mentioned rugby, you've mentioned cricket, and someone is saying, does your research have any lessons regarding tactics for team sports? It's probably not something that I, I think too much about in my day to day in terms of tactics and team sports. Um, so the simple answer is probably no to that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, but maybe it's something I'll reflect on. Right, good. And on a similar theme, does modifying technique help amateurs more than elite professionals? And the questioner is saying, does changing an elite athlete's motion risk reducing performance? So the answer to the second questionnaire is yes. Um, there was a there was a period in in biomechanics and working with sport where there was a temptation to you must change something uh, to improve, and I think more recently um, people are far more hesitant to change. Where biomechanics is most useful is building up really good robust techniques in the young athlete who's coming through, um, so that when they reach the top end, they've got that good technique, that that good foundation and base, and athletes then find their own way to their own optimum, I think, at the very top end. Whereas, you know, there are examples in sport and you know, Ian Woosman, for example, in, in golf, they changed his golf swing because he had um, some injuries. I don't know the specifics. He wasn't the same player. He never performed quite as well. And um, so where I think we are in sport now is if we understand the injury risk of an elite athlete, then we can manage their workload and maybe get, make sure they're strong enough to cope with the, the rigors of the sport without affecting their performance. Because performance is the critical thing. That's their point of difference. Um, and it, maybe we have to manage injuries and manage workload and keep them conditioned appropriately to achieve that high level of performance. Right, just two more questions for you, Mark. Okay. Rosman. Carmichael is asking, how important is height in different sports? So, you know, it was interesting. A few years ago, I went to um, a pre-Olympic conference in China and we, we went round one of their local uh, training high performance centers and we walked into the gymnastics hall and all the gymnasts were very small, very, very short for want of a better description. And then we went into the basketball hall and they were all seven foot whatever. And, um, it, you know, different sports have different requirements quite clearly. And mechanically, if you're shorter, and you're, you can rotate and spin much quicker. And therefore, that's why divers and gymnasts, et cetera, tend to be smaller. Um, whereas if, you know, um, you're a basketball player or uh, other sport, height is more important. And so it, there is certainly you can talent ID based on size and shape. And some countries do that. So they'll look at you and say, well, you're more likely to be good at this sport than that. And there's some truth in that. And Ronald Singleton is asking, are elite athletes born, not made? <laughs> the million dollar question. Um, I think it depends. Um, I think there is, but it, I think what most people don't realize is that elite athletes train really, really hard. And there's there's some and you know uh, thoughts out there that you know they don't train hard. But it, it, look at Stephen Hendry in snooker, you know, or, or whatever. Um, they've practiced and practiced and practiced. They may have had some good natural abilities, but at the elite end of sport now, they train really, really hard as well. Right. Well, thank you. And with apologies to anyone whose question wasn't included, I think you've answered on a great range of topics, both directly within your field and some slightly out with it. So that was excellent in my view, and I hope our audience shares that. So thank you ever so much, Mark, for, well, certainly broadening my interest in sport and hopefully adding to what everyone else knew.